to safeguard consult at worldbank.org uh, if you um, want any further detail, Anne Katrin can provide that. Um, Sumir uh, will guide us through the discussion today. He'll be the master of ceremonies. Okay. And Mark, as I said, uh, will introduce the framework. Um, we also have our colleagues from the global practices uh, in, in the room. In particular, uh, I, haven't, well, I haven't seen him, I think he's there. Uh, there's Ede, uh, who is in charge of the um, global practice that is responsible for social development, um, amongst other things. Uh, we also have our colleagues from the environmental uh, global practice here somewhere. And uh, Maninda is also there, that's right. Maninda is there. We also have uh, Charles from the legal department and uh, many other colleagues who've been helping out uh, uh, either on the operational side um, or, or on the review side or monitoring side. So it's a, it's a big team, it's a complex uh, undertaking, and we're very happy to hear your questions. Uh, but first, let's hear from, from Mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so uh, thanks, Stefan. Um, so as you heard from Stefan, we've got uh, a number of our colleagues from other parts of the bank who've been involved in this process in the room as well to take part in the discussion. So the way we were proposing to conduct the discussion is after Mark presents the proposal itself, is uh, based on what we've been hearing about the, the issues that are of real, uh, that have been of real interest to all of you, uh, that we would, in order to be able to go in depth into each of the issues if it's okay with all of you that we would uh, take each of the issues in turn and 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 have your questions come uh, on those issues and the ones that we've sort of identified based on what we've been hearing are um, uh, the the whole uh, subject of non-discrimination um, labor and working conditions indigenous peoples uh, land and involuntary resettlement uh, biodiversity uh, and human rights and if there, if there are more that you would want to go into uh, we are we'll be very happy to uh, discuss those as well but perhaps we could start with taking each of these in turn and spend um, as much time or as as you you need on each one of those uh, we would expect that in total they would average out and we would be able to conclude by by the scheduled time but even if we overrun and uh, we have to vacate the room or anything like that for the next event, the team will still be very happy to continue the discussion with you if there's anything that we haven't been able to cover during this time. Um, uh, for, the, for the people watching online, we don't have a live chat facility, but you can certainly send in your inputs and, and questions uh, through our consultation website. And in the course of this consultation process, we will uh, uh, take on board and address whatever your issues are. So uh, uh, I'm told that coffee will appear at some magical moment in the morning. So. If as and when you need that refreshment, you can just check if it's out and you can step out and do that. We'll take a break at some midpoint. Again, we'll just sort of time that at some sort of uh, logical point in the discussion. And uh, with that, let me just hand it over to Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone here. And uh, greetings to everyone online from a, a very wet Washington, D.C. So just to set the scene, in terms of why the safeguards review, Stefan's uh, touched on a, a few of the, the points um, in, his, uh, in his introduction. Uh, the bank's standards, policies at the moment are very old. Uh, it's about time they were, they were looked at, um, and I'll go through some of the additional reasons of that in a, in a moment. But first of all, I wanted to just set the scene of, uh, of the safeguards and um, manage some expectations uh, around the, the, the role of the safeguards and the new framework going forward. The bank has overriding goals, which as you know are to end poverty and promote shared prosperity. All the bank's projects are geared towards that, so those goals. In doing so, it's possible on projects to have unforeseen adverse environmental and social impacts. And the purpose of the 
the safeguard policies or the framework going forward is to make sure that for every project that we have, we look at that project uh, from the perspective of environmental and social issues. If there are any uh, adverse impacts that could possibly arise, then we have to characterize those and we have to address those. So the safeguard policies currently and the new standards going forward are not meant to be the panacea for everything the bank does in terms of education, urban transport, health, or whatever. They're a complementary function to those, those project areas. Now, since the safeguards were originally drafted uh, in, their, in their current form, society's expectations have changed dramatically. Our environmental and social awareness has, trained, has changed dramatically over the years. So there are many, many new issues today that we need to take into account uh, when we draft a new framework uh, for tomorrow. Clients have progressed in their ability to manage environmental and social issues, and we have to recognize that. The bank realizes that uh, it has, has to modernize its approach in, in many respects. And as you know, we've been going through a large reform process, which is aimed at making the bank much more operationally efficient. We've learned from the lessons, or we're learning from the lessons of the evaluation report that was carried out in 2010 by the IEG group internally. And also, in the first round of stakeholder consultations, we heard from stakeholders very much so the need to um, modernize the bank's approach and to deal with a broader range of issues. In terms of phase one, we, we held discussions around the world which were very much in abstract. They were in relation to the existing set of safeguard policies and we were asking people to give us observations on those current safeguard policies and what new issues we would need to look at going forward. During that, that phase one period, we had many, many written submissions uh, from all sorts, all aspects of uh, civil society, from governments, uh, academia, etc. We also had a number of expert focus groups listed uh, here, land tenure, natural resources, uh, indigenous peoples, labor, occupational health and safety, uh, climate change, uh, human rights, and uh, disability, gender, and uh, other aspects of vulnerability. We also had uh, dedicated meetings with the indigenous peoples communities around the world, and also with uh, project affected communities. We've also benefited from a lot of work that you've done as CSOs, um, Ryan is here from IAP and they've done a lot of work with uh, communities to see how communities are actually affected on the ground and uh, our thinking has been very much informed by the work uh, of many of you. Now we heard that we should look at a host of issues ranging from animal welfare to disability to LGBT, LBGT issues uh, to climate change and so on. And some of the, the biggest areas of concern were in these areas listed on, the, on this slide. Firstly, in terms of indigenous peoples, that we should consider introducing free prior informed consent, uh, that we should address better human rights and the principle of non-discrimination in our projects. We should address labor concerns, that we should broaden the coverage of safeguards to cover, cover other bank instruments, that we should cover a broad range of issues uh, of uh, some would say vulnerability, that we should also take into account the fact, as I mentioned earlier on, that the countries do have, many countries do have capabilities to manage environmental and social issues. And what we heard from many countries is, don't come along and simply superimpose your bank requirements and standards over us, why don't you have a look to see what we have in place and where possible, why don't you use our existing uh, legislation, competent authorities and processes to give you the uh, output, the safeguards that you would like to see on, on projects. And so we've been trying to uh, build that into this framework as well. We've also heard that the bank needs to get much better at monitoring and supervision. 
that there's been too much focus uh, on getting together documents, frameworks up front before the board, uh, but less emphasis on looking at how people, communities, the environment are actually affected on the ground by projects. Now going forward, as Stefan has mentioned, we have a period of consultation ahead of us. And this period of consultation, which has just begun, is very much enriched by the fact that we now have a draft set of documents on the table to discuss. So rather than having abstract discussions, which we had in the first phase, we now have the opportunity to discuss in detail um, some text on the table. And this week, I know you've all been very busy in, in meetings, as have we, we've had many meetings. I know looking around the room, I've met with many of you many times, uh, and we've been able to talk about some of these issues. So the process of discussion is, is just beginning. And already this week, we've learned of a number of areas where we need to change the text, provide further clarification, and so on. So I, I just want to emphasize, as Stefan's mentioned, this is an ongoing process. This draft is not cast in stone. We can make improvements, and with your help, we will make improvements. And as we go forward, uh, we will have dedicated discussions on a number of uh, areas. Uh, we'll also build on some of the existing meetings that are out there. For example, the Civicus meeting, which I will be going to with a few colleagues in a, in a couple of weeks, weeks' time. Uh, yesterday, we were talking to uh, people from the uh, LBGT community uh, about some of the meetings that they have um, uh, coming up. And we'll be t attending those meetings also and uh, meeting with uh, people from um, that community around the world in a safe environment. And we're talking to um, representatives of the community about how we can meet with them in the countries around the world, in the regions, in a safe environment. And I think you know what I mean by that. The process of consultation will continue, not just on this draft, but on the subsequent documents that we produce. What we're talking about right now, and you have in front of you, is the framework, which, as I'll come into in a moment, talks about what the bank is required to do, but also the 10 areas of uh, captured in the standards which we require borrowers to address. And then underlying those documents, we will have to produce more mandatory requirements to touch on detailed aspects of resettlement or um, stakeholder engagement or how we deal with biodiversity issues. So there will be more material that will be coming out that is mandatory in nature and some that will be tools and guidance later on that we will uh, hope to have your input on. Now the, the framework, as Stefan uh, mentioned, uh, aims to benefit all. It's meant to benefit communities by providing them with a broader range of uh, issues covered, better social and environmental protection through a broader range of issues considered in our uh, appraisal processes. Uh, it's meant to deliver better development outcomes on the ground and through focusing more on how actually people are affected on the projects, we hope to be able to manage uh, issues and bring about more uh, development outcomes on the ground uh, in that way. And also, and I think this is a very crucial point, these documents are much more detailed in many respects than the existing LPs and BPs. And with the subsequent documents that will be produced, the directives and so on that we will, we will draft, these present much more clarity on the role of the bank and the borrower, and they present enhanced opportunities for people to hold us accountable because it's much more clear in these documents about what the bank is supposed to do and what we expect of our borrowers. So the framework builds on the existing safeguards, preserving the core values within them. It's taking a modern approach. It's addressing more issues than were previously covered. It's taking a risk-based approach, which means that rather than focus on whether a project ex ante is A or B or C, what are the actual risks associated with that project to people and the environment? And how might those risks change over time? And that's a key element of our approach here. We're, we're actually looking 
at the riskiness of projects over the long term, not just before board, but through the life of a project. So if issues arise on projects during implementation, we will raise the risk rating. And what that means is we will pay more attention, we will divert more resources to working with the borrower and to affected communities and to the environment to make sure that we deal with any issues that are arising. The outcomes-focused uh, outcomes approach, which I know many of you have also stressed in the documents that you've submitted to us. Some of you have produced uh, detailed drafts on how we should look at safeguards, how issues, for example, on climate change. And those documents have built into them um, the idea that we have to have a more outcomes-based approach going forward. <coughs> I've touched on the, on the range of uh, social and environmental issues that have been broadened, and I'll come on to those in the, in the next slide. Um, I've also already touched on the, the clarity. What's also important here from a borrower perspective is that <clears throat> the draft documents allow for a greater degree of harmonization with other financial institutions. Now, what that means is not that it makes our life easier, but it means that borrowers who often have limited resources, don't have to deal with a multiplicity of different requirements from different borrowers. But because our borrowers are become, our, because our requirements are becoming much more aligned, it's much easier for borrowers to uh, deal with lenders than uh, has been the case in the past. And many have raised this issue of, of the, the resource aspects of trying to please many different borrowers as they, as they see it. And the, the final point is here that we are looking at our relationship with borrowers through a partnership lens. We are learning from the um, mistakes of the country systems approach that was undertaken previously. And we're recognizing that at the project level, it's very important to see what borrowers have in place in terms of their legislation, their competent authorities, and their processes and where those can be used to give us the environmental and social outcomes we expect on projects, then we will use borrower systems. But the important thing here is we also need to look at the track record on the ground. So how, how have these things actually been working? It's okay to, to, to look at the legislation and look at an organogram of how things operate, but how has this actually worked on the, on the ground before we decide whether we can work with uh, a borrower framework or not. Now, in terms of the, the framework structure, it's a hierarchical set of documents. We have the overall vision statement, which articulates the, the bank's view and values with regard to a broad range of sustainability issues. Uh, it makes the linkage to other areas of the, of the bank's work. The bank's done projects in, in many areas covered by the safeguards, um, safeguarding the, protecting the interests of the LBGT community in, uh, in Latin America, for example. Below the level of the, the bank policy, we'll be developing these detailed mandatory directives which address very specific areas that are covered in the, the policy and also the standards. On the borrower side, the 10 standards will be matched with more detailed mandatory requirements uh, covering areas such as how to do a socioeconomic survey, uh, how to take into account uh, climate change and adaptation issues on project projects. And many of the tools and materials that some of you have developed, frankly, we will be drawing on those uh, to prepare these, these detailed directives and uh, tools. And then we'll have the procedures, best practice notes, and so on. And there'll be a very strong commitment, uh, a huge effort to provide internal capacity building to our own staff in rolling out this new framework and also to work with uh, borrowers, CSOs and others to understand the framework and to make sure that it's implemented uh, on the ground. Now what binds the, the borrower and the bank is the legal agreement and in terms of environmental and social issues what we're proposing is there will be an environmental and social commitment plan between us and the borrower which will capture all the actions uh, that a borrower needs to undertake to address the environmental and social issues. 
it'll deal with any capacity building issues that are needed on, on projects as well as any uh, physical actions. And that is a legally binding document. We have an opportunity to disclose this document as it evolves from the very earliest instance at, um, at concept notes, right through as appraisal is carried out, as detailed environmental and social studies are carried out, carried out and highlight actions that need to, need to be addressed. Those can be built into the um, commitment plan. So it's an evolving document that will increase in complexity through our appraisal process before we go to board and you will have an enhanced opportunity to look at that document as it's evolving. What's important about this commitment plan also is that it's a living document and we can change it after board approval during the implementation stage. So if unforeseen circumstances arise on projects, if some changes need to be made to a project like a small micro alignment changes on a road or so, so whatever, uh, those can be uh, reflected in changes uh, in, a, in a commitment plan, in the commitment plan. Now the, the bank's role and the borrower's role stay very much as they have been in the, in the, in the past. Borrowers are responsible for implementing their projects. Bank staff largely sit in Washington in, in country offices. Bank staff do not implement projects. Borrowers have always been responsible for implementing their projects. But the bank works with borrowers and helps borrowers in that respect. What that means is that in some countries, conflict and fragile states, for example, we are working hand in hand on the ground with our borrowers to help them carry out the environmental and social appraisal, to develop management measures to address environmental and social issues. That means that in some projects we have people on the ground for, for weeks, months on end. Recently for a large hydro power project, uh, along three people from, from my department were working with the borrower to help them deal with the environmental and social impact assessment and bring it to a, a stage where uh, it would be fit for the purpose of, of public consultation. So we will work with borrowers as much as we need to to help them uh, meet their requirements and our expectations within this framework. Now the draft, as I mentioned, is meant to cover, to address all the issues that we've uh, heard during the first round of uh, consultations and outreach. And I've just picked out, we've just picked out some of the issues here. We've introduced free prior informed consent, which is a, a major iconic demand, as I know many of you know, uh, from the indigenous peoples communities around.